Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on marketing the e-commerce business. I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'm going to be your host today, and our presenter today is Cliff Enico. Uh, more on Cliff in just a minute, but first, uh, some brief information on SCORE. SCORE is a national organization that is part of the Small Business Administration of the federal government, and uh, nationally, we have over 320 chapters and 11,000 plus volunteers. Uh, locally here in Score Fairfield County, we have over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. And we offer three primary value added services to small business owners. Uh, first of all, we offer um, free one on one counseling that's face to face, telephone, or email. And you can um, request that by going to our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org, and request the mentor link. Um, we'll also be putting up a link on the screen um, that you can see. Uh, secondly, we offer educational workshops and webinars like the one today, about 150 of those throughout the year. Uh, you can take advantage of those in person or by webinar or on our YouTube channel. And lastly, we offer extensive resources on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org, including access to subject matter experts. Our next webinar is going to be two weeks from today on Tuesday, December 3rd at noon. And the topic is Lessons Learned Running a Business from Sales to Finance to HR and More with Matt Krieger presenting. And you can find more details and specifics on our, again, on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. Um, we have set aside time for Q&A at the end of Cliff's presentation today. Um, so if you have a question, please use the chat window. At the, you'll find that at the bottom of your uh, screen. And just to clarify, please use the chat window and not the Q&A button. And you can uh, put those in at any time during the um, uh, webinar and we'll take them uh, either during the webinar or, or at the end. Uh, to respect your time, we'll end sharply at one o'clock. Um, the session is being recorded and you can listen to the record, recording and see the presentation materials on our website within the next couple of days. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, Cliff Enico is a nationally recognized small business legal and tax expert. He's best known as the former host of Money Hunt, where entrepreneurs defend their business plans before America's toughest panel of experts. An attorney and small business consultant based here in Fairfield, Connecticut, he has helped launch over 15,000 businesses. He is also the author of 16 books, most recently, The Crowdfunding Handbook, How to Raise Capital for Your Business Using Equity Funding Portals. I'll now turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, it's all yours. Hey, great, Bob. Thanks much. And, and welcome to everyone here. Thank you very much for taking some time out from your, your busy holiday season, your holiday shopping, uh, to spend an hour with an attorney, of all people, uh, who's going to try to teach you how to market and how to sell yourself. I've um, been doing this for a long time. Um, and uh, you know, it's sort of funny, you know, when I say that, you know, people say, wait a minute, wait a minute lawyer you know what does he know about about selling well you know I've been an attorney on my own now for over 30 years and uh, every day I have to sell myself um, and, there, and you know, when you do that you learn a lot when I was doing this uh, the you know the internet was just a glimmer in somebody's eyes uh, I had to teach myself how to do a lot of this stuff and uh, I've learned a lot mostly by experience now, now you if you by looking at this slide you now know that I am an attorney um, you know, this is something I, we have to do before any program. I will be getting into some legal and tax stuff in this program, but I'm not really giving anybody here legal advice. Uh, there's a very big difference between saying this is kind of what the law is all about uh, and this is what you should do, John and Mary, this is why you should do something different. I don't know any of you well enough to be able to give you one-on-one -on -one advice, so if you do listen to something I say here and it sounds like a great idea and you do it and it doesn't work out, uh, you end up, your business fails, you end up filing for bankruptcy, your spouse divorces you, your kids don't want to talk to you anymore, your dog pees on your leg and you end up living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, you can't sue anybody, okay? That's just, that's just the message of this slide. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, welcome to the internet. The internet, believe it or not, it's so, it's so weird for somebody my age. I'm 65 years old. The internet is really only about 25 years old. 
which is really, to me, amazing. When did we first become aware of the commercial? Well, the internet itself was around, of course, since like the 1960s or something. It was part of the Defense Department or something like that. But most of us only became aware of the internet and started doing things online in the early 1990s. I want to say 1993, 94. That's only 25 years ago. Uh, that wasn't a long time. Uh, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember life before the internet knows, we know how much has changed. This is probably, you know, for us baby boomers, this is probably the biggest thing that has happened to the world in our, our 65 some odd years of living on planet Earth. That's changed the world in a dramatic place. We've learned a lot in 25 years, but we're still learning. The internet is only 25 years old, and I always tell people selling online today regardless of what kind of business you have. It's a lot like driving a car in 1918. You know, people weren't stupid back in 1918, you know, when the automobile first came out, uh, right after, years right after World War I. Everybody knew that this was gonna be the future, that people weren't gonna be driving horses and buggies anymore, that this was gonna be the future, but people weren't running out and buying cars, you know, by the millions in 1918. Why? Because the infrastructure that you need to make the car happen uh, wasn't there in 1918. You didn't have a lot of paved roads. There were no gas stations on every uh, uh, street corner the way there are today. There were no mechanics. If you ever look at cars, if you ever go to a museum and you look at cars from that era, you'll see that they had big running boards on each side and there were boxes of tools strapped to the side of the car with leather straps. That's because if you were driving and you broke down somewhere, you were the one who had to get out and get under the car and fix the problem to keep going. Um, selling on the internet is, is, is a lot like that today. You certainly can do it and you can make lots of money doing it, but you gotta know a little bit about what goes on under the hood. We don't have the automatic transition as yet. It's kind of like an electric car. Um, I, I, the, the, the analogy to electric cars is perfect. We all know that electric cars are gonna be the future of driving you know, in time, but people aren't running out and buying Teslas by the millions yet because we don't have the charging stations on every street corner. We will have them eventually. Uh, every year there is something new to learn uh, and it's constantly changing. Okay, let's talk about some basics first of all. If there's one thing we've learned about the internet, the internet is not, web marketing is not a push medium. Now what do I need, mean by that? Most advertising media and promotional media that we've experienced in our lives are push media. You create a message and you push it in people's faces. The web doesn't work like that, however. Uh, if I have a message that I wanna push in your face, you have all kinds of things on your computer that can prevent my message from getting through. So if I wanna send you an email, that you don't wanna see, you have a spam filter. If I, if I have a pop-up message on my website, hey, Cliff Vinico, real great attorney, give you a free hour, you know, something like that, you have pop-up blockers that can stop that. Uh, even though my message is a good one and it's one that you need to hear, you are in control. When you are shopping online as a customer, as a consumer, you are in control of what you see and what you don't see. And if I'm a marketer, I gotta break through all your defenses and I have to get through to you in some way. Selling on the internet is not about pushing your message in people's faces, it's about pulling the customer to you. I have to seduce you. I have to get you interested in what I am doing and get you to come to me and see what I've got online. That's how it works. Uh, it's, a, it's a different way of marketing, it's a different psychology that it takes uh, to be this kind of a marketer. But that's one thing we've learned about the market, about the web. Secondly, and this should come as no secret, the web can be an unforgiving place. Mistakes are often brutally punished. Uh, people are, are, are turned into animals online sometimes because so much of what goes on online is anonymous. Uh, people can hide behind their masks and just tear people apart. I had a situation just the last couple of weeks uh, on a site called Nextdoor, which we're going to talk about uh, in a few minutes, uh, where you know somebody went online and they ragged about a local pizza place that had been run by a local family for 50 years. And you should see the pushback that that person got. I mean, apparently they had a bad experience. And they had a legitimate bad experience, but at least 60 people came and they started you know, ragging on this person, telling them that they, they, were, they were idiots. Uh, you know, one, in one case, you know, saying, I know where you live. I mean, you know, just because they said something bad about a local pizza place. You know, I mean, if you step out of line on the web, 
you know, the, the consequences can be ferocious. So you gotta be very careful how you do your marketing online. And then last but not least, marketing online is labor and time intensive. There are so many places now, and the marketplace is more fragmented than it ever was before. When I was a kid, we only had three major television networks. And at any given time, you know, when I went to school and we would talk about TV shows, we all knew what we were, what we were talking about because we either watched CBS, NBC, or ABC. Those are the three networks back then. Now you have 50,000 channels online. And it's quite clear. I don't know. I mean, I, haven't, I, don't, I don't hang out in grade schools anymore. Uh, but I wonder what the kids talk about today because chances are you've got 50 kids in the playground. Each of these 50 kids has watched something different. You know, so what are they talking about? in the school playground. I kind of wonder about that. Uh, not that I'm going to start hanging out in the school playgrounds any, <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, trust me on that one. Um, so you've got to look for the biggest bang for your buck here. You can't do everything. It's physically impossible to be everywhere on social media and online. Where are you going to get your biggest, your biggest where, where are your customers living? Where are they? Not where you think they should be, but where are they? Focus on what works. If, now, I'm a lawyer, okay? What I do is not very interesting graphically. You know, I mean, if I put a photo up of me sitting at my desk drafting a contract, I guarantee you I'm not going to get a lot of likes on Instagram. It's not, it's not visually very compelling what I do. Um, you know, what works for you? Although I find that YouTube videos work very well for me. Uh, which is actually interesting. I think a lot of attorneys would disagree with me on this, but I find that getting out there and talking about the law and what works and what doesn't actually gets me a lot of this. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, you only have so much time. Be sure you're spending it on things that work. So uh, here is what your online business should look like. Uh, but for those of you, you know, I always get a good laugh when I put this slide up. This is obviously an octopus or a, uh, a, a squid, or if, if, you're, if you have any Italian Americans on the, on the call, squingili or calamari, we eat these things, okay? Um, if you look at the, at the octopus very closely, you'll see that it has three basic parts to it. You've got the head, you know, with those ugly eyes and that those horn thingies there. That is really the central, the CPU. This is where everything happens in an octopus. This is where the brain is. This is where the sensory organs are. This is where the digestive organs are, where the, uh, the octopus digests its prey. Um, it's the central command station, if you will. Then you've got these eight things hanging out, sticking out there. They're called tentacles. Uh, these are the things that float in the water and seize prey that is passing by, you know, food that the octopus likes, okay? Uh, and there are eight of them, that's why we call it an octopus after the Greek octopod, eight-footed, you know, that's why we call it there. Uh, if you ever seen one less than, uh, less than uh, eight, it's because it's, it's, it's gotten to some bad, it's some bad neighborhoods. Um, then the third thing you see are these sucker thingies that are on, uh, the, uh, that are on the tentacles. The way an octopus works, the tentacles float around in the, uh, in the water, they, uh, they pick up on prey, and the sucker thingies feed the prey into the, the head, which is where the prey is ultimately digested. That is how a, a, an octopus works, okay? An e-commerce business is exactly what, uh, you, an exact metaphor for the way a successful e-commerce business works. When you are building an e-commerce empire, you are building an online octopus. The head is your website. Every small business, now I know it's 2019, and we've got all kinds of social media and apps and all this stuff, but if one thing that hasn't changed in 25 years, if you really wanna build a successful e-commerce business or online business, you have to have a killer website. There has to be at least one place on the web where people go and they only see your stuff and what you are looking to sell. Um, I, I, there are two reasons why you need a killer website. Number one, people expect you to have it. Um, if you are Cliff Enico and you're not cliffenico.com, you're something else, that's kind of a buzzkill for me. That takes away a little bit from your credibility. I expect you to have a website that is tied in some way to your brand and to your brand image. Um, and this is where, so that's number one. Number two, there is only one place on the entire web where you can sell stuff and keep 100% of the profit and the money that you make. And that is the stuff that you sell on your website. You can certainly say on sell on eBay and Amazon and other places like that, but you're gonna pay a huge fee for that privilege. Okay, you're gonna share a lot of that revenue with the sites, that, with the platforms that you're selling on. The stuff that you sell on your website though, 
You don't have to share that with anybody. You keep 100% of what you make. This is where your best stuff should be. This is where your highest margin stuff should be. And the goal of everything else that you do online should be to drive traffic to your website, to the head, like the octopus, where, where the, the tentacles, the tentacles are the outposts, every other place that you sell online. And you don't have to have eight of them, you can have as many of them as you want. This is where, this is your eBay store, your Amazon sellers page, your Craigslist ads, and anything else that you do where you are actually selling on other sites other than your website. Those are your tentacles. That's where you grab people. People see your stuff on eBay, and if they really like it, they'll say, what? geez, I wonder if he's got a website. I wonder if Cliff has a website, because he probably has better stuff there. And they'll start looking for your website. That's the octopus and how it works. Um, steps three and four are the sucker thingies. Uh, I don't know what they're called, by the way, I'm an octopus. All I know is what I see on the Discovery Channel, so don't hold me against that. I'm not a, a marine biologist, I'm a lawyer. Um, but steps three and four are your marketing efforts. These are the sucker thingies that you do, that you use to drive your, your prey, your customers, to your website and to your online outposts on eBay, Amazon, wherever else you sell. Uh, and there's two kinds. You can either market online or market offline, and you should do both, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about offline marketing. Even in 2019, a lot of people selling online are getting more success from their offline marketing sometimes than from their online marketing. Then step five is measure your performance. Know what's working. What's performing for you? Where are your customers from? If your customers are not coming from Instagram, why do you have an Instagram page? Kill it. It's not doing anything for you. Why are you spending an hour a day updating all your Instagram photos if they're not getting you people? Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we call web analytics later on. So um, you now have built the octopus. And now it's time to learn all the marketing tools that you need to do. This is a marketing program, after all, uh, to drive traffic to your head so that you can digest your, your prey. The head is your business website. Everything you else, else you do online are tentacles that drive traffic, prey, customers to your website. Um, there are many different choices that you can make. You, you have to... It, you, there are only 24 hours in a day, there are only seven days in a week. Your job is to optimize your time so that you're spending as much time as possible on the things that actually work. So let's talk about the first thing, which is search engine optimization, I said, or SEO. I said at the very beginning of this program that the web marketing is all about pulling customers to you. You can't just go out and push your message in their faces. People get offended by that. Uh, they have ways of blocking you. You gotta somehow seduce them and draw them to you. And one of the tools that you use is SEO or search engine optimization. This is designing your website, designing your tentacles, your, your outposts on eBay, Amazon, Craigslist, wherever you're selling stuff, in such a way that it becomes attractive to search engines. One of the things we learned around the year 2000, back in the 90s when the web first came all, along, we all thought that the magic was in the portal, in the website, and the content of that website. And it still is true to some extent, but the fact of the matter is, if people don't know, you can have the greatest website in the world, but if people don't know you're there, it, they can't find you. The trick is to be visible to the search engine spiders, they're called, SPDR, it stands for something. But Google, this is what made Google a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, the people that found Google, founded Google back in the late 90s realized it's not about the portals, it's not about the websites, it's about the search engine. If you've got the best search engine out there, that's what people are gonna be looking to, 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 to search the web. And, and Google set out to create the best search engine available and then they succeeded, which is why those founders are now multi-billionaires. Um, finding the right keywords. Um, when search engines search, they search for words and specifically they look for nouns. And finding the right words, keywords, is something of an art. It's not entirely a science. When you search for somebody like me online, do you search for an attorney? Do you search for a lawyer? Do you search for a counselor? Those are very important questions when you're marketing online. What are the right words that will get you the traffic that you need? 
Um, and maybe you need to do something a little bit more specific than that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there are various tools that will help you find the right ad uh, keywords. Google has at least currently the best stuff. They have Google Suggests, Google AdWords. Uh, there's also a, a non-Google program called Keyword Tracker where they survey a lot of online sales and they can tell you, well, this word works a little bit better than that one. If you use plural, it's a little bit better than if you use singular. I mean. You might want to consider, you know, hiring an SEO consultant uh, to help you with this because it is something of an art. Just don't trust anybody online who says that they'll get you on page one of Google. And no, nobody can make that kind of promise that you will be on page one of Google for a particular search. Anybody who, who makes that kind of claim is somebody you probably shouldn't be doing business with. Use lots of nouns. Search engines look for nouns, you know, and use lots of nouns. Um, each page should have its own content. Um, use the strongest keywords early on in your, in your page and don't repeat keywords unnecessarily. When you put copy up on the web, read it out loud. If you can't understand it, if it sounds like a machine drafted it, it's probably not the right stuff to put up there. So that's SEO. Then we have SEA, Search Engine Advertising. Years ago, this was called Pay Per Click. Uh, you create an ad on a search engine um, and you pay a fee each time that someone clicks on the ad and is pointed to your website, whether or not they buy anything once they get there. That's a very important point. A lot of people, when they talk about their web traffic, they say, oh, we've got so many clicks per month. Well, unique clicks and unique visitors. Well, that's kind of interesting information, but it really is kind of useless in a way. If people are clicking on your website because you've got really cool content on there, but they're not buying anything, why are you doing this? I mean, are you just in the entertainment business? You want to just entertain people and you don't really care that no one's paying you for it? Well, if that's the case, then what you have is a hobby. You don't have a business. A business is people paying you for your stuff that you're selling on there. Um, always remember that clicks are kind of are important, but they're kind of irrelevant. Um, there is a, a Google. Again, Google tends to have the most, the most sophisticated things out there. Um, there is a... Um, a program you can sign up for called Google AdSense, where they will place ads on your website, you know, ads for other people, I should say, on your website to drive traffic there. So, you know, if you're selling ladies, you know, apparel or something, uh, they may put an ad for Victoria's Secret on your website or something like that. So people go there, they see the ad. But be sure to monitor the results, however. I mean, are these ads working? Are they pulling? And also, be sure you look at what's going on on your website and make sure that, you, that the right ads are going on your website. Years ago, when Google was young, uh, I actually, you know, I used Google AdSense. I had them uh, put ads on my website, and, I'll, and I discovered that some of the ads were from competing law firms and law firms that were my competitors locally. Uh, why am I having my competitors' ads on my website. They've gotten better. The algorithms have got for Google AdSense have gotten a lot better over the years. But make sure you look and see, you know, if they're putting stuff on your website that is politically or morally objectionable, you know, you don't want your name associated with, you know, certain ways of thinking, certain groups, you know, that kind of thing. You know, be sure you're, you're, you're following up and make it a dialogue with Google to make sure they know uh, that you don't want just anything to be put up on your website because it suits them. Um, tips for controlling costs. Know what keywords your customers are actually searching for. Do they search for attorneys? Do they search for lawyers? Uh, choose narrow focus keywords or combination of keywords. If you have a local business, don't just go out and take out attorney as a keyword. Take Fairfield, Connecticut attorney if your business is primarily local or attorney 06825, which is the zip code for Fairfield, Connecticut. You know, I mean, if I'm in California, I'm, I'm not probably not, and I have a local thing, I have a, I'm looking for an attorney to help me for a house closing, for example. Chances are, I'm not looking for people in New York or Connecticut, I'm looking for people in California. Um, you know, use negative keywords uh, to eliminate uh, you know, irrelevant, you know, queer queries. So, you know, attorney, not patent or something like that. I don't do patent work. So I don't want people calling me and wasting my time looking for patent searches because I don't do them. Uh, you know, try to control, you know, to try to you know, control your cost so that the only people that are clicking on your website are people who are legitimate prospects. 
Okay, email newsletters, okay? Not as popular as they used to be, but people still do them. Over time, you build a, a database of contacts, email people, uh, and you want them to keep reminding them that you're still out there. Uh, hi, Cliff Enico, I'm still alive, I'm still on the right side of the grass, you know, please call me, I can do some work for you. Um, you know, you've only got, one of my clients says that all the time, every time I say, how you doing? And I call him up because I'm on the right side of the grass. He's from Brooklyn, I, you gotta love a guy like that. Um, you keep in mind you have exactly half a second to get somebody's attention. I mean, I, I really hate to, to tell you this, but when I'm you know, looking at my email inboxes in the morning and I look at the, the promotions and all that stuff, I am clicking the delete key like this. And I hope you can hear that. About roughly half a second, I am deleting a message. Your heading, your headline is the most important thing. You know, and, and every once in a while, I will stop and look for something. But you have to grab my attention. Remember, you got to seduce me. You got to grab my attention. You got to say, wait a minute, well, that's, that's not junk. Wait a minute, that's not spam. I want to look at that. That's what you got to do. If you can't get me to that point, you're not going to reach me. Although you might, you know, if all you're doing is putting a headline saying, you know, uh, Cliff's Antiques or something like that, well, maybe that's good enough because you're reminding me, wait a minute, yeah, Cliff's Antiques. I want to buy an antique at some point. Cliff's Antiques, he's still out there. Okay, great. And maybe that's all you want to accomplish. But if you really want to get me to come into the store and buy something, I think you need something a little bit more than that. Don't overdo it. Keep it short. Use bite-sized nuggets. People do not have the time to read lengthy text anymore. Use bullet points, short, snappy sentences. Should you use a newsletter provider, it may be useful, but make sure that you check their check their um, their bona fides, their reputation. Look at the reviews that they've gotten online. Um, there are a lot of people out there that do spam, uh, that are really just spammers, um, and you do not want to be associated with something like that. Um, there's something called an autoresponder that you can put on your email newsletter to get your customers to opt into your newsletter. This is very important now. It's becoming more and more important as we become more sensitive to privacy. Uh, some of you know that the European Union passed a big law last year called the GDPR, uh, which is a massive privacy statute. And basically, you know, the, the old days where we could simply just sign you up automatically for our newsletter and you have to opt out are going away. And more and more now, you're gonna to have to ask people to opt in. And if they don't opt in, well, then you're just stuck. You can't just add them to the list and hope that they'll opt out, opt out at some times in the future. Uh, under American anti-spam law, you must have a mechanism for people to opt out of your newsletter. That is federal law. That's also the law in many states. They're called anti-spam laws. Uh, and make sure that your opt out works. I hate it. Hate it, hate it. When someone sends me a spam email and I go to the bottom, I click the unsubscribe button and I go to a, uh, an error 404 page. I hate that. I wanna opt out of this newsletter and you're not doing that. Or even worse, where I, I click on the unsubscribe button and I have to do like three or four more things to opt out of your, new, of your newsletter. I should be able to click one button and opt out of your newsletter. If not, I could potentially report you to the authorities. So don't, make sure your opt out is a legitimate one. Uh, consider using a mailing list manager. There are several of these online. Uh, the biggest one, the one that most people use is an outfit called Constant Contact. They will take care of a lot of this for you. They will make sure that you, they, um, um, that you are in compliance with federal and state laws regarding spam. Uh, of course, they charge a fee for that. Well, it's, well, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, I'm actually thinking of doing a newsletter now, and I'm actually thinking of using Constant Contact, actually. The reputation is pretty good. Okay, blogs. Fastest growing area of the internet. This is where you go online each day, and you tell people about your life and what's going on and what you're thinking about. Um, it could be a great way to promote your business. Um, keep in mind, it's all about content. Uh, successful blogs are, I always tell people, whenever you're blogging, you are in show business. You're in the entertainment business. You can't just get away saying, hi, I'm having a special these days on teddy bears, uh, you know, so all teddy bears, 20% off during the month of August. Okay, you can do something like that. But most people, you know, are looking for something 
that is entertaining, fun, something that, that, that pleases them in some way. So putting up a picture of teddy bears engaged in some outrageous content or positioned in some way, you know, that will get a lot more attention than just, you know, all, all teddy bears 25% off during the month of August. You know, do something cool with it. Um, you know, do something fun. Make, make people laugh. People say, you really want people going around saying, hey, you got to look at Cliff's site. He's done something really weird this week. You got you to really look at this. This guy's, out of, this guy's out of his mind. You want people doing that. This is good stuff. Use a personal tone. Here, you know, don't be afraid to show a little bit of yourself and who you are. At the end of the day, especially if you're in a service business, people don't buy your service, they buy you. Um, let them see who you are. Let them see your personality. Are you funny? Are you emotional? Can you make people laugh or cry, um, you know, intentionally? Uh, that's, you know, something, that, those are talents, and that's what people look for. They want to have their emotions manipulated in some way. Um, you know, include lots of keywords. Remember, nouns. Search engine spiders love blogs because there's lots of nouns, lots of keywords, lots of content. Should you put on comments on or comments off? Do you want people to interact with you? Um, this is a very philosophical decision. Uh, I'm in a business where, frankly, I have ferocious competition. I tend to do comments off when I do my blogs because I just know that my competition is gonna start uh, posting negative stuff if I leave comments on. I might, may not always catch it before it's too late, but you may be in a different situation. Uh, you may wanna interact with your marketplace more than I do. Uh, use an RSS feed. This is a very important thing to generate subscriptions. Basically, if someone really likes your blog, they can click on an RSS button and they basically get an email every time you, you post a new, uh, a new blog entry. Uh, it, it won't show them the blog entry. They still have to come look at your blog, but it tells them that there's something new at the Cliff Anico blog. And make sure you keep it updated daily or weekly. Blogs are wonderful ways to get your message out to people, but they can really be time vampires if you're not, uh, if you're not careful. And that's just true of a lot of social media, by the way. The key to success on social media is you got to always have new stuff every day sometimes several times a day, depending on your business. Whenever you're in show business, people want to know, what have you done lately? What's new? What new comedy routine has Sebastian Maniscalco come out with? I know all this other stuff. I've seen his, his, his HBO specials 10 times. What is he doing that's new that I haven't seen before? You always got to come up with new and entertaining stuff. You're in show business. Microblogs, the most popular one, of course, is Twitter. Is it strictly for the birds? When you're on Twitter, what you're looking to do is you're trying to build a following. You want, you want people hanging out and listening to what you have to say. For a while, actually, I actually had a little historical, this is a little historical footnote, but for the longest time, I actually had a record on Twitter. Uh, for the longest time. I, I signed up for my account about 2012, 2013, but I didn't actually post anything until about 2015 until somebody told me, hey Cliff, you realize you have about 800 followers on Twitter. 800 people were following me on Twitter and I hadn't posted a single tweet. I, I, I just, I felt sorry for these people. You know, I, I just, I, I kind of visualized them as sort of the Israelites in the desert, you know, 40 years looking for something. That's kind of how I visualized these people. They were waiting for a word from the Messiah. I was waiting, you know, that's kind of how I thought about it. And, and then when I started tweeting, I thought half of them dropped off. So I, I think that tells you a little something about Twitter. I know it's a, still, it's a stupid story, but it, not every business lends itself to Twitter. If you've got something to say, and you can say it at least several times a day, um, you know, Maybe you should be on Twitter, uh, or maybe you should be running for public office. But we won't. We will not. We will not go into that. Okay. Uh, there are other things too besides uh, Twitter. Um, uh, Seth Godin actually created this about ten or fifteen years ago. It used to be called Squidoo. It's now called Hubpages.com, where you can create like a lens where you and a select community can talk about a, a shared subject of interest, like you know antique mechanical banks. A lot of a lot of hobbyists and antiques people uh, create lens on Hubpages.com where they can talk about the hobby that they're passionate about. Um, book marketing, marketing sites, these are still around. Um, they're kind of old fashioned, but you can still get a lot of business on them. These are some of the most important ones. Online forums and e-zines, I refer to these as micro sites. These are websites in general where a very narrow community of people are talking about something that they're passionately interested in. So if you 
are selling an antique mechanical bank on eBay, let's say. You can certainly put the bank up on eBay and you will attract you know, a, a following. There are people who buy antique toys, antique mechanical banks, but there's also a site called mechanicalbanks.com, which is the website of the Mechanical Banks Collector Society of North America with you know, about 15,000 members in 20 countries. These are passionate high-end collectors of antique mechanical banks. And you can put an ad up on their website for if you, if, you, if you pay for an annual membership of about 20 bucks, you know. So if you're selling an antique mechanical bank, a good one, would you rather be on eBay or would you rather be on mechanicalbanks.com? I think you'd rather be on the latter site. And frankly, it's a lot less expensive. And, you're, and there may only be 5,000 people looking at that site, but all of them are passionate antique mechanical bank collectors. Um, you know, those are the kinds of communities that you're looking for when you're selling stuff online. Uh, sometimes it doesn't matter how, how many people are looking at your stuff as long as they're all quality customers. Okay, let's talk about social media now. Facebook, I mean, social network media now has been around for about a little over a decade now, close to 15 years, and we're learning that certain things work on, on certain sites that don't work elsewhere. Facebook is mostly about friends and families. This is where I'm sharing pictures of my latest vacation, the cute thing that my dog or cat is doing. Um, it's a way of keeping in touch with, with friends and family. In fact, we, people, we actually refer to my family as a Facebook family. Uh, we're all over the place. We hardly ever see each other anymore. Facebook is the primary way that we keep in touch with each other. We're a Facebook family now. Um, LinkedIn is networking for business primarily. If you're a corporate person, this is where you look for jobs. But if you're also a local service professional and you service a, a B2B community, you're selling primarily to other businesses, it, a, a, a good LinkedIn page can be a good way to get business, especially if you're selling to large corporations. Large corporations are tuned into LinkedIn. That's where they look for services. Uh, if you sell things to the Fortune 500, that's what. If you don't have a good LinkedIn page, you're you're not getting to your target market. Instagram. This is a photo sharing site. A picture saves a thousand words. If what you do is extremely photogenic, um, if you are a health and fitness consultant, for example, and you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, or Jennifer Lawrence or something like that, this is where. You know, you definitely want to be. You know, if you look like me and you're trying to pitch yourself as a personal trainer, you stay off of Instagram because you'll never get any business. Anyway, uh, <laughs> credibility is very, very important. You know, if you've ever seen me online or in person, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pass muster as a personal trainer. As, as a, as, as a gourmet specialist on Italian food, yes, absolutely. Um, but not, but not, uh, not as a personal trainer. Anyway, uh, I'm getting too personal here. Okay, some social networking tips. Don't spread yourself too thin. It, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do mass marketing anymore. Know your niches and, and where do they hang out? You know, who's, who, your, who are your customers? What niches do they occupy and where are they hanging out on social media? Um, use your photo, do not use a cartoon character. This drives me nuts. When I see someone who I know personally and I know they're a great professional and they're very competent and they've got a picture of Mickey Mouse as their, as their LinkedIn you know, avatar, do not do that. That bothers me. Put a real photo up that looks like you. You know, I'm sorry, you're not a cartoon character. You're a real person. Do not waste time on trivia, what you had for lunch. Nobody freaking cares. Okay, let's just stop all this. If you're talking about business, this is where you want to be. I'm going to talk about, too, there's a new one out now called nextdoor.com. Uh, uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, new uh, social media site. Basically, this is like a mini community of people who share the same zip code. Um, you know, so when, I, when you get a message from somebody, when someone posts a message on Nextdoor, you're reaching everybody with an email address in your zip code, which is very, very interesting. Um, for especially for local businesses, for people that have the local businesses that have a very small radius, nextdoor.com. So, uh, but, but you got to be careful how you do it. So, for example, um, I get Nextdoor every day and, and I look at it, and there are times I will recommend local businesses and stuff like that. But there's one guy, I have to say, I, I, really, I really like this guy, but I want to strangle him. Um, his name is Vinny. Whenever somebody puts something up on Nextdoor, hi, I'm looking for a local handyman to help you know, rebuild my kid's uh, tree house in the backyard or something like this. This is what you do on, on, on Nextdoor. You look for you know, local people who can help you. Hey, does anybody have any chickens or something like that? I'm thinking of starting a, you know, 
putting a chicken coop in my backyard. Anybody make chickens? They can sell them. Seriously, you see stuff like this. And this guy named Vinny, he always answers the ads. He always says, hi, I'm Vinny. I'm a local handyman, and I'd love to help. Okay, now that's great. Except there's one problem. He doesn't put his freaking phone number or email address in the post. So how are you supposed to reach him? You know, I mean, are you going to reply to his message? You're probably not. You know, you don't want people seeing the response. You don't want to admit that you need, that you're an idiot who doesn't know how to put together a toy, your kid's toy for Christmas and you need help with this. You want, you know, somebody like that. You know, he's, he's losing all kinds of business because no one can contact him in the real physical world. No one ever responds to his posts. And I want to strangle the guy. I want to say, put, and I probably will. Somebody say, Vinny, you sound like a great guy. Would you please put, you know, a phone number or an email address on your post? You'll probably get a lot of business. But then nobody listens to me. All right. Online reviews, very important topic. Get over it. People look for them and people read them. How many times have you bought a book on Amazon because all the consumer reviews had five stars? Be honest. Okay, let's be honest about this. Even though I hate to burst your bubble, has it ever occurred to you that most people who post online reviews on Amazon either work for the publishing company that publishes the book or works for a publishing company that has a competing product and they want to hate, they want to hate on this book? Okay. Let's face it, use common sense. Do you have time to post online reviews? How much time do you have in a given day, in a given week to post online? I don't know about you, I have no time. I have zero time. I'm not, you know, I mean, if I read the latest Stephen King novel, I mean, forgive me, I love Stephen King, but I'm not going to go online and say wonderful things about him. You know, he's got tons of people saying wonderful things about him. He doesn't need me saying, me too, I love Stephen King. He doesn't need that. I don't have this time, right? Normal people don't have time. Who posts online reviews? People who are paid to post online reviews. Unless, there's one exception, and that is someone who has had a truly miserable experience with your business. That's the negative. If someone really hates you, they will flame you on every social review, online review site that is out there. So you got to look at what's going on uh, in, in the world. And when you see negative reviews online about your business, you jump on those. You do not sit though and ignore those because that is a black eye that your business has. So for example, if you are a plumber um, and someone has a bad experience with a plumber, this is where you can say all the bad things about local plumbers, uh, including nextdoor.com. Okay, here is some advice on online reviews. If there's an online review site that focuses on what you do, so for example, uh, for lawyers, there's a website called avvo.com, A-V-V-O.com, which is for lawyers. Um, and if they, if you, if they will give you the chance to create a web page for your practice for a reasonable fee, like five bucks a month or something like that. Do it. I always tell people, do this. I mean, one of the dirty little secrets of online review sites, if you are a customer, and you have a page on the review site where you're inviting people to post reviews, they will be a little gentler with you than they will if you don't have a, uh, a site with them. You know, I mean, let's face it, some of the people who, who put up post negative reviews are batty, crazy lunatics, okay? And they're obviously batty, crazy lunatics. Whether or not their negative review makes it to the site, however, may depend to some extent on whether or not you are a customer of that website. I hate to be cynical, uh, but I think it's just a facts of life. You should encourage your customers to post positive reviews, lots of them. I mean, if someone says, hey, Cliff, I got a great, you, you were great, and you did a great job for me. I really love the way you handled my thing, my nonprofit. I really love what's going on. What I do, I don't just say, well, would you say, would you please say something nice about me on your social media? I would say, well, look, if you really, really, you know, like me, here's what you can say about me. Give them the blurb so that they can just cut and paste it on the review site. Draft the review yourself and ask them as a courtesy, would you please just post this on, on you know, avo.com. And they probably will do that if they really do love you. But be careful whenever, it, it, if there's a quid pro quo, Okay, and this is something a lot of people don't know. The Federal Trade Commission has a set of guidelines now for bloggers and other people who review things online professionally. If you are getting something in return for posting a positive review, it's okay, but you have to disclose that 
somewhere in the review. It's like at the end of, the, of, the, of a game show where they say uh, certain guests have received promotional consideration from our sponsors. You have to do that when you're when you are giving people something. If you're so, let's say if you want to say, hey, if, if you say something nice for me about, about me on Avo.com, I'll give you a free hour on your next on your next piece of business. That has to be disclosed in the review that you're doing that anymore. Podcasts, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it can be a great way. I mean, what I'm doing right now technically is a podcast. You're listening, so I am reaching you. Uh, just make sure that listen to your voice online. Um, you may want to consider hiring a voiceover pro. Uh, to do your pot, your, your Andy Devine, by the way, if you look him up online, he was a, a famous um, actor of the 1930s and 40s. He did a lot of Westerns and he had a voice like gravel. You could just, you could barely understand what the guy was saying. If you look him up online, listen to the audio clips. You don't want to, if you sound like Andy Devine, get somebody professional to do this for you. And remember that when you do audio, it raises the pitch of your voice slightly. So you may want to consider going a bit deeper so that you sound, you come out sounding a little bit normal uh, online. Um, podcasts, you have two choices here. There are some landline services that will set up your podcast for you. Talkshoe.com, Zoom.com is another big one. In fact, we're using Zoom now. Uh, full disclosure, free advertisement. Or you can set up your own studio with certain equipment um, if you have a Mac, uh, GarageBand is the software of choice that you use for doing podcasts. And if you have a Windows computer, Audacity. Uh, there are others, but these are sort of the, the gold standards. Okay, YouTube and online video. And then we'll, 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 we'll say a few words about this, and then we'll go on to questions. Must be visually compelling, educational, and or entertaining. Don't just get on YouTube and talk about what you do. Talk about the things that people care about. You know, if you're forming a nonprofit organization, here are the three biggest mistakes people make when they set up nonprofits. Do something like that. Give people education. Educate them or entertain them. They will feel grateful and they will be more inclined to contact you. Sweat the details. If, if it looks like you're doing a webcam in your bedroom, okay, it, 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 no one's going to take you seriously. Lighting and background are important. If you are a professional, you must look professional. Look, watch out for things in the background. If you are doing a, a thing in your bedroom and there's funky, like really weird, you know, photos on the wall or you know, like posters on the wall, either take them down or just do a, a white background. Seriously, people take you seriously. Um, there's, there's a famous uh, eBay uh, uh, photo, which has become sort of, which has become, you know, totally viral about a guy he must live in a very hot part of the country but he was taking a photo of an object and there was a mirror on the back wall which reflected back and showed him taking the photo and he wasn't wearing any clothes when he took the video um it, it has it, it is a viral ebay you know photo and the ebay actually uses it as an illustration of how not to take a photo when you're Taking, you're taking shots of, uh, of merchandise uh, that, that you want to sell online. Anyway, um, okay, a couple of things about guerrilla tactics. Um, guerrilla tactics are extreme um, tactics that you use to generate business, you know, for your, for generate traffic for your website. Um, okay, here's a dirty secret. Even in 2019, the best marketing for a web-based business may be offline marketing. How many of you have visited a website because you read an article about it in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times? Or you saw an ad in a magazine that said, you know, for this actress, is she doing wonderful things? Check out her website or whatever. We all, don't ignore offline marketing because it may be the best way to, to generate traffic for your web, for your e-commerce empire. And remember what Zsa Zsa Gabor said, there is no such thing as bad publicity. The more extreme, the better. Rent a billboard for a week. If you travel up I-95 near Bridgeport, Connecticut, there's a huge billboard, which you will see, with the phrase, your wife is hot, exclamation point. And you look at that and you say, what? And then you look, it's for a swimming pool company that put the bill swimming pools. What's the swimming pool? It's a famous book. It's been up there for at least 30 years, by the way which means it works, okay? Do something wild at your office. Celebrate a wacky holiday. Every day is a holiday, you know, National Peanut Butter Day or something. Call the local TV news channel and tell them you're doing something weird. All the workers have to dress like peanuts, 
You know, I mean, they're always looking for weird stuff like that. You know, get them over there. Uh, we have a local podiatrist uh, here in Fairfield County. I won't mention names, but whenever something new is going on in podiatry, he calls the local news channel and say, hey, you know, we'll demonstrate there's a new procedure where, you know, your ingrown toenail will not grow back. And it will, it's very visually interesting. Well, you know, it, it send over a crew and we'll, show, we'll do a demonstration for you. Do stuff like that. You know, get yourself known as being, you know, the local wacky podiatrist that does crazy stuff on uh, Channel 12. Do that. Your local travel traffic and weather channel, every cable system has a traffic and weather channel with a five minute loop on traffic and a five minute loop on weather. In between the loops, they have space for ads. Buy a five second ad on the buffer. Um, years ago, we had an estate auctioneer uh, in Fairfield County who did this. It was just a simple ad. It was a five second ad, him in front of a bookcase with a toll free number and it said, hi, I'm so-and-so of XYZ estate auctions. We buy, we sell, we take consignments. That was it, that was the entire ad. But that ad was playing every five minutes, all day, 24 seven. He got a ton of business out of that. And I can't believe he paid a lot of money for it because he was one of the cheapest people I ever dealt with. Anyway. Don't be afraid to be shameless, but don't be so far ahead of the curve that you disappear from you. If what you're doing is so radical and so new that people don't understand it, you're probably a little too far ahead of the curve. Okay to be a little bit ahead of the curve, but don't, um, but don't get too far ahead. So we're not gonna talk a lot about analytics. I'm almost out of time here. Um, these slides are, are both basically about, about analytics software, how you measure your success. Learn a little bit about marketing metrics, um, uh, and especially what we call the click-through rate. It doesn't matter how many clicks you have on your website. The important thing is, of all the people that are clicking on your website, how many are actually looking at the internal pages and buying stuff? That's called the click-through rate. It's the most important me metric for web commerce. Um, Basically, three keys for web marketing success. Be realistic about your products. Make sure you are selling to real people and make sure that you are advertising and promoting your business where they really are. Not where you think they're going to be, but where they really are. Remember that web marketing is all about pulling people to you. It's not about pushing your message in people's faces. Make sure that you devote at least 20% of your total business time to marketing. I would say a little more if you're marketing on the web. Web marketing is a time vampire. If you're not spending at least an hour or two a day updating your tentacles, your social media uh, accounts, your, your eBay, your Amazon pages, if you're not doing that at least a couple of hours every day, you are not giving that activity the time that it deserves. I would say at least 30% of your time should be, if you're advertising heavily on the web, should be devoted to that. And be aggressive. Sales will not happen until you, unless you make them happen. Don't be afraid to be outrageous and don't be afraid to do things that may, th may make some people think you're crazy. Um, I, seriously, it's harder and harder now to stand out on the web. You have to be more, more and more extreme to stand out from the pack in, in, when it comes to web marketing. Don't be afraid. Be utterly shameless about getting your message out there. I mean, if you look good in a bathing suit, then wear the bathing suit online. And, and I'm serious about that. Don't be afraid to do stuff that, you know, that will make people say, you know, you've got to really look at this person. I mean, this guy is built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I want to know what his fitness plan is. You know, don't be afraid to do stuff like that. Here are some books uh, for further reading. Not all of them are by me, are by me uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I am really not a social media expert. I have to say that I'm still wrestling with the whole question of what social media can do for me. Um, but there are other books by people who, who do a better job of this. Um, for those of you who are selling on eBay, I do have a couple of books where I talk about what, what, what works uh, marketing-wise on eBay. Um, and then this is what they look like. And... This is me. Uh, for further for further information, um, we may not be able to answer all your questions today, but um, those that I can't answer, if you send me an email, give me a couple of days. I'll certainly um, you know give you uh, my, my thoughts in a hundred words or less as to what I think you should be doing. So with that, let's take some questions. I'm going to turn the floor back to Bob. Bob. Great. Uh, thanks, Cliff. We'll use the remaining time for uh, Q&A. Um, as a reminder, uh, please use the chat function. You can get that right at the bottom of your screen and uh, you can put them in the chat box. We do have a couple of questions to start off with here. So um, a question from uh, Josh. Uh, Cliff, uh, what sort of content pulls people in on Instagram? 
Okay, Instagram is about photos and you know very very short videos so it has to be something that is entertaining yet relevant to what you do you know so your kitten your your, your cute kitten playing with a um you know with a ball of yarn or something like that is might be really effective if you're a veterinarian or somebody who deals with animals or pet food or something like that if you're a lawyer obviously it's totally irrelevant to what you're doing although maybe a cute thing to do i mean i i don't know what's worse not getting any hits at all on my Instagram page or getting a million Instagram hits and no, and no customers. I don't know what's worse. Uh, I think the second thing is actually worse. I'm doing something right, but it's not doing anything good for me. Um, again, be a little bit outrageous, Josh. I don't know exactly what your business is, but remember the swimming pool guy, the swimming pool company that advertises your wife is hot. Now, some people might be a little offended by that, actually, by that, especially in this era of Me Too, um, that that is, does show a little bit of toxic masculinity there, but, you know, it doesn't really hurt them. That, that billboard has been up at least 25 years, and, and I can tell you right now, so it must be working. Hey, uh, great. We have another uh, question uh, from Dave. Any, any thoughts on your website having a company name versus your name? Um, you know, contact sole proprietor, service provider, is the context that he's asking the question in. Okay, I could give a whole course on choosing the right web domain name. That's a very popular topic. In fact, uh, those of you who know, I have a YouTube channel uh, with 40 videos on it, you know, for people that are starting up small businesses. And I actually have one there on trademarking your name, and you know, whether you should go and, and do that at some point. It really depends. When it comes to a website URL, if your company name is not memorable, I wouldn't use it as a website URL. I would definitely want to get the UR website URL for your company name just to make sure that nobody else gets it. But you should be using something that is memorable. So if if you're if the name of your company is Liberty Gibbet Corporation, for example, which nobody knows how to spell, you want you probably want to be FlibertyGibbet.com just so that nobody else gets it. But if your trade name is Cliffs Antiques, that's what your website URL should be, CliffsAntiques.com. Um, the website URL should be something that's easy to remember, hopefully trademarkable. Uh, again, I, I do a whole YouTube video on whether or not things are trademarkable. Um, and it should be easy to remember, easy to type, and it should say something about your business that will, that will make people want to come to you. Uh, so Cliff's Antiques may not, I'll, I'll give you a wonderful example about this. My, my ancestors came from a very small town in Italy called Olivano Sul Tulciano. Uh, it's south of Naples, about an hour south of Naples. You're almost near into Lucania province in Italy. But they are known for their olive oil. That is what they are known for. It is the cash crop. This village lives and, and breathes olive oil. That's what they do. So what is their website? Well, their website, they do have Olivano Sul Tulciano.com, but can you spell that real quick? I mean, come on, I just did it very quickly. What's their website? Worldsbestoliveoil.com. That's what their website is. And that really works for them. Now, of course, it's all in Italian. So I really wish that they would put their website in English. That, that, I, I really got to contact my, I probably still have some third cousins or something over there, and I really should talk to them about this. But that's how you decide the right URL to use. That's a good example. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for uh, one last question. Um, but uh, do you think a coming soon campaign is viable even though you're not sure when your web developer will finish your website? This is an absolutely wonderful question and I'm actually glad that you raised this because it really bothers me when I go to a web, a URL five times and it still says coming soon. And I think that's, that's really the answer. It's okay to say coming soon, but give them something that seduces them a little bit, that says, you know, I want to come back a month from now. Um, don't just say coming soon, you know, our new business, you know. People look at that and they say, eh, okay, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But if you say coming soon, you know, and, um, you know, we, we will have a special promotion for the first hundred people who look at, you know, what we do, that will get, you know, people much more likely to get people coming back. When you commit to setting up a website, by the way, make sure you do it. And if it's a website that you're not going to use, make sure that your web developer points it to a website that works. 
So for example, I mean, I, I mean cliffenico.com is my website for my law practice, but I also own cliffordenico.com, cliffordrenico.com. I also own cliffenicosucks.com, by the way. Um, you know, I own these URLs. I pay five bucks a year from GoDaddy to keep them up, uh, up, to, up, up to stuff. But I also make sure that my web developer points them to a, a site that actually does work. So if you do happen to see Clifford R. Enico and you type in cliffordrenico.com, you'll go automatically to cliffenico.com. And also if you type in cliffenicosucks.com, you will also go automatically to cliffenico.com. I love that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's, that's great. That's, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, as a reminder, the, uh, the webinar has been recorded. And the materials will be available within a couple of days on our fairfieldcounty.score.org website. And our next webinar will be two weeks from today um, at noon on December the 3rd. And it will be Lessons Learned Running a Business from Sales to Finance to HR More with Matt Krieger presenting. Again, um, SCORE offers free individual counseling, so if you're looking for some individual free counseling, you can request a mentor on our website. Um, when you uh, complete this webinar, there will be a screen that takes you to evaluations. We would really appreciate those. They help us with future programs. So on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending our live webinar today. And in closing, big thanks to Cliff for presenting. Have a nice day, everyone. <laughs>